Chapter 251 Arrested You are listening at NovelFull.audio The local authorities did arrive at the scene in about six minutes and it did not go how Marcus expected it to go at all. The medical officers went ahead and treated the heavily injured bar dot owner and the mage, while all of Marcus's henchmen and he himself were brutally arrested. Two of Marcus's tier four henchmen were executed on the spot for attempted murder and when one more tried to resist the arrest he was knocked out cold. Marcus's protests of, do you know who my father is? Fell flat on Warren officials who did not give a solitary fuck if Marcus's father was a monarch. Thrown in a detention cell with heavy prisoner chains, Marcus had a breakdown as he could not figure out where his life was going wrong. Countless times he had acted the same way in many different vampire cities and there had never been any ramifications for him. Dot the vampire lords would either apologize to him for having to take so much trouble, or would turn a blind eye to the matter and let his actions slide. Never did he face the humiliation of being arrested and never did he have people turn down bribes of the highest magnitude just to uphold justice. To make matters worse, the masked man and his dwarf accomplice had cowardly decided to run away, and actually succeeded in doing so. The entire exercise was for naught and had only backfired on Marcus. The news of his arrest spread fast, and this made Marcus even more irritable as if there was one thing he could not stand getting tarnished, it was his pride and his reputation. The beef had been created, both with the masked man and with the Warren city officials, and there was no mending of ties possible from now on. In his mind Marcus had decided to punish the masked man, even if it was the last thing he ever did as he knew that the moment he was released he was going to pay the Assassin's Guild a ridiculous sum of money to place a hit target on the man. Initially, Marcus believed that it was all a big shakedown, that the Warren City officials were playing hard dot ball just to increase the price of his bailout, but when he was forced to spend the night inside a prison cell was the moment he realized that the other party was not messing around. It was then that Marcus began to scream and curse and threaten to wipe them off existence as he demanded that he be allowed to make a phone call to his father. Little did he know that a furious Regus Aurelius was already on his way to the city and was by no means pleased by the actions of his firstborn son. Meanwhile Max, Max soon got the news that his attacker was none other than Marcus Aurelius and that he was now detained by the city officials. Max felt incredible rage boiling inside his chest when he realized that the same man who had molested Asiva was the one trying to attack him, as he momentarily regretted his decision to run away as if there was one bastard Max wanted to desperately disintegrate into a million small pieces it was Marcus Aurelius. The news of the arrest quickly made local news and there was no doubt in Max's mind that this was going to become an upcoming international affair. Under such circumstances, he knew that it was best to leave town before things got too heated as Regus Aurelius was certainly not going to take the locking down of his son lying down. Hence, keeping a tight lid over his anger, Max and Sebastian skipped town and went back to Rising, Star Planet where they were supposed to meet up with Asiva and Anna. All in all there were a lot of questions that Max needed answers for, which were why was Marcus Aurelius after his life? Was it because of Asiva? Was it because he was the individual in VIP plus two and was being petty over a lost bid? Was it because Regus Aurelius knew that he was the prophesied kid with the blood manipulation ability and hence he sent his son to get the job done? Or was it some other reason? There were a million reasons for why Marcus might not especially be fond of Max, however the exact reason behind his attack remained unclear. Meanwhile Rudra, Rudra was in deep meditation as the chaos energy of the universe swirled around him like he was a black hole sucking it in, as his body was slowly being reconstructed from all the particles. Not being able to move was a crippling experience for the weak-willed, as floating in nothingness with nothing to do but to wait for your limbs to be regrown was a difficult process to go through if one was not stable at the brain, but while it was a tragedy for most, it was an unparalleled opportunity for Rudra. Although unable to train his body, the void of nothingness that he was in and the chaotic energy around him gave Rudra the unique opportunity to hone his mind and learn to sense his senses from the start. Rudra had started to become aware of every molecule, every cell inside his body as he could feel their reconstruction and their purpose of existence. 
Rudra was able to understand the laws of the universe to a much deeper extent now that he was unable to experience any of them physically and this brought a great increase to his comprehension abilities and his school of thought. Rudra was on the cusp of understanding something grand, something fundamental and unique. Something that nobody ever thought of but everyone felt, and he knew that the moment he managed to figure it out completely, he would have a powerful weapon to use against the queen and the dark faction. Forward slash forward slash forward slash a slash n. Bonus chapter for hitting the power stone target, good job everyone. Let's keep up this pace of hitting targets daily. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 252 Fatherly Duties You are listening at NovelFull.Audio To say that Regus Aurelius arrived in Warren City pissed would be an understatement. Regus Aurelius was a disciplined man, and while he was manipulative and by no means perfect, he was a man of class and stature. When he arrived in Warren City, the Tier 7 god responsible for the safety of the entire auction event was present at the teleportation center to greet him alongside almost all the top staff of the Seven Galaxies Bank. Greetings Vampire Monarch, greetings, greetings Lord Regus, everyone greeted Regus Aurelius with respect, however, Regus Aurelius only made eye contact with the Tier 7 god while ignoring everyone else as he gracefully began walking towards the prison facilities. Why have you detained Marcus Aurelius? Regus asked, as he used the full name of the prisoner rather than calling him his son. With all due respect monarch Regus, your son acted like a spoiled teenager at the auction house, giving no respect to the decorum of the event. He lost a bid for a peculiar item to a VIP customer and began demanding that the winner of the bid be removed as a member of the bank and his bid be invalidated in respect of your status as the highest member. But while we turned a blind eye to his transgression there, he caused a ruckus at a local bar asking his underlings to attack and kill two men who were drinking inside the bar, but when the bar dot owner refused to comply to his wishes and hand over the two men drinking inside his establishment, he decided it was only fair to kill him as well. His actions were attempted murder, a crime for which the penalty is death in Warren City, but since he is your son we have reduced the sentence to seven days in prison, the tier 7 god reported not a single muscle on Regus Aurelius's face changed as he heard about the punishment, however, internally he was extremely disappointed. Regus doted on his first son, maybe because he was the one to give Regus the joy of becoming a father for the first time. However, he did not approve of his son's lifestyle. Not only was he not committed to training, his ego was sky high with no accomplishments to back that ego up. Even as a monarch Regus made sure to train 6.8 hours every single day, not because he wanted to or needed to, it was because training was a part of his daily routine and a necessity for him just like breathing. While his second and third sons understood the importance of living a disciplined life, the first one was a stunning failure of the Aurelius bloodline. Your sentence is fair, if possible I would like to meet with him in prison once, Regus said as the Seven Galaxies bank officials were shocked by this statement. Everyone had heard the rumors that Regus Aurelius was a just and fair king, however, nobody expected him to be this rational when it came to family matters. The Seven Galaxy bank did not wish to offend a man like Regus Aurelius and would have let Marcus go if Regus demanded his release, however, the monarch of the vampire clan did nothing of the sort. We will certainly allow the monarch to visit his son, the Tier 7 god said as he led Regus straight to see Marcus. Inside the prison interrogation room, Regus sat on one end of the interrogation table and waited patiently as the officials brought Marcus. When they brought him, Clad in chains, Regus's heart bled a little for his boy, as a hint of anger directed towards the Seven Galaxies bank erupted in his chest, however, his face did not show this anger. Expressionless as ever, Regus maintained eye contact with his son and said nothing as he sat in front of him. Marcus on the other hand was extremely elated to see Regus, but his happiness turned into instant gloom when he realized that his father was not smiling when he saw him, meaning that he was most likely angry. Is this your way of bringing glory to the Aurelius name? Regus asked very calmly to Marcus who shuddered at the question, It is not my fault father, the masked man I was after, he deserved to die, he outbid me, made me lose face. 
It was unacceptable, Marcus said as Regis's eyes dropped in disappointment. Explain to me son, how exactly did he outbid you? Were you bidding with your money? Or with mine? Regis asked him in a stern tone as Marcus found no words to refute his father's question. You are too proud for your own good, you gloat around the universe and act like you are some big shot when you are nothing but a tier 3 wastrel. Without the Aurelius name, without MY name what even are you? You have never earned a single bronze coin in your life, never worked hard to be a warrior, never worked hard to buy a weapon. But you will do all that from today. Because from today, I Regis Aurelius strip you from your name, title and privileges as the prince of the Aurelius clan. You cannot use more than 1 million gold coins a month, which will be your monthly stipend and one tier 5 guard that will only be there to protect you and not carry out any orders for you. You will be deployed on the eastern battlefront to earn merit points and serve the military there. You will join the military as a captain, you will work your way up to becoming the eastern division general and then and then only will you get your name and your privileges back. ENV today, I come as a loving father. But the next time I see you it will be as your lord and patriarch. You will either clean up your act and become worthy of the Aurelius name, or you will die without it, Regis said as he watched the color drain from Marcus's face. I'm sorry, father, please don't punish me like this, Marcus pleaded but Regis stared straight into his eyes and let a small amount of his aura slip through to completely suppress Marcus. Just this small amount of my aura and you can't even speak. Pathetic weakling, Regis said as he stood up and walked out of the building, leaving Marcus in the pool of his own sweat and shame. This punishment was as hard on Regis as it was on Marcus, however, the patriarch of the Aurelius clan knew that he had to be strict with his son, because if he was not he would be the criminal to his son's downfall. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the GT target good job everyone forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 253 Band joins the army you are listening at novelfull.audio. So you three have decided to join the Titus clan. You do know that clan has been on the decline ever since the death of Rumi Titus Wright. Anna asked the trio as she was a little taken aback by their decision to suddenly join the Titus clan. Well, we've thought this through, you can choose whether you want to come with us or not, we will have no hard feelings either way, Asiva said as she gave Anna the ultimatum. Anna wanted the group to join the elven forces where they would be guaranteed fair treatment and could grow as a team, however, it seemed like her other friends had decided a different course of direction without consulting her. Max who wanted to be a little more diplomatic said, it's not like what you propose is a bad option Anna, to be honest it's a bloody good option, but the goals me and Asiva have can only be achieved this way. For now, for me and her, it's the only option we have, Asiva rolled her eyes, she did not like drama, however, Max's words seemed to have moved Anna's heart as she sighed and said, all right fine, since you guys don't have any other option I guess I'll just tag along, yes. Sebastian cheered when Anna agreed as the four friends burst into smiles. There was strength in numbers, and there was strength in their friendship. With all four of them joining the same organization there was a good chance that they got better treatment and missions. So is it just us four or is the sweeper also tagging along? Anna asked as Asiva glared at her and said, that's my god, father, you put some respect to his name, Anna put her tongue out indicating that she was only kidding when out of nowhere Severus appeared behind the group and said, well it's not an insult to be a sweeper although you say it like you think it is one I am proud of my profession. I clean the universe, it's the most noble thing to do, Jesus Christ Severus, you need to stop popping up unannounced, Sebastian said as he sheathed his sword back. The unannounced jumps were now turning scary, not for the group but for Severus, as although Severus had done it too many times, the group was no longer composed of tier 0 students who were defenseless against his jumps but of tier 3 warriors who could reflexively attack when being jumped on, unintentionally harming Severus. In Sigma, Higher-tiered warriors could visit lower-tiered planets, hence Severus could visit rising, star planet alongside the group as they headed towards the Titus clan recruitment center. The Titus clan's banner was the Holy River of Blood, Sanguis, 
they had a black background with one red river flowing through from amongst glaciers, showing that the clan was originally from Ixtal, the holy land of vampires. Outside the recruitment center stood an elegant lady who broke into a cute smile when she saw Max's group approach as she said, Young ladies and gentlemen, are you perhaps interested in joining the glorious Titus clan? Max stepped forward and said, Yeah, please lead the way, the lady was a little surprised to see that the most mature-looking tier 4 dude was not the leader of the group but it was the mysterious masked man instead. Enthusiastically leading the group into the recruitment center, she quickly offered them a seat as she rushed up to the higher-ups seated inside to inform them of the newcomers. A few minutes later a man dressed in the neat military robes of the Titus clan walked out of the back room and greeted the group as he said, Welcome, I'm Major Ratty, I have been informed by the scout that you are willing to join the Titus clan as a group. While the standard tier 3 individual is only allowed to become a captain upon entry, I can make your leader garrison commander if this group can show enough competence. It just so happens that my previous garrison commander died a few days ago on a mission and my brigade needs a new one. Max walked up to Major Ratty and extended his hand for a handshake, and gave Major Ratty a particularly firm one as he said, Oh, we are competent don't worry about that. Major Ratty tried to shake off Max's grip, but he found it extremely difficult to do so as although he was an early tier 4 military official he found himself hard pressed to fend off a tier 3 warrior like Max. All right. Let's discuss your salary and fill up the form then. You will be vetted and your information will be recorded. You will sign a system contract of fealty to the clan and will only then be allowed to become one of us if you have any special requests then you should inform me now, Ratty suggested Max smiled under his mask as he said, I'll like my unit to be compact and consist mostly of close range warriors or infantry, Ratty very disciplinarily said, I'll see what I can do. Before walking back into the back room and finally letting out a small yelp for all the pain his hand felt from Max's grip. Initially Ratty did not want to agree to giving such an important position to a completely new group out of the blue. But something about Max's uncanny strength and his determined eyes made it impossible for Ratty to say no to him at the moment as he accepted the proposal just to get his hands free. As for Max's intentions. Ratty was not worried about that as the signing up process was thorough. Nobody could become a military official for the Titus clan without signing a lot of system documents that would ensure their loyalty and silence on all military matters. It was impossible for spies or defectors to enter the army through the official recruitment channel, that much was for sure. Chapter 254 New Job You are listening at NovelFull.audio Not gonna lie, you look kind of hot in that military outfit, Asiva teasingly said as she leaned in for a kiss. Not bad eh? Max said as he gave Asiva a short kiss. Max was dressed in traditional green robes of the military and his shoulder pad had one star and one stripe showing his position as the garrison commander. Asiva on the other hand had the same sort of green robes, but hers only had one star showing her position as a captain. Today marked the new start of their life's chapter as Garrison Commander, Raven, was going to take command alongside his three captains Asiva, Anna and Sebastian and one sweeper slash spy Severus. The chain of command in the Titus clan military was simple. A unit of ten soldiers was headed by a captain. Usually a unit had tier 1 or tier 2 troops with annual pay of about 20.25k gold coins a captain on the other hand was paid 50.70k gold coins a year. A group of 10.20 units made a garrison, headed by a garrison commander. The salary of a garrison commander was between 100.120k gold coins a year and they were eligible for lifelong pension after service. About 5 garrisons made a brigade, headed by a brigade general. Usually brigade generals were early tier 4 warriors and were in charge of controlling a small land area. A brigade general's salary was 200.250k gold coins annually and they were well respected across all Titus clan territories and establishments. A collection of 5.10 brigades made a major unit, headed by a major. Usually majors were veterans at the peak of tier 4 or having shown excellent judgment and war acumen. Major Ratty was one such major under whom Max was a garrison commander. 
Major Ratty commanded 7,000 troops total and was one of the 2,500 majors in the Titus clan army. Above a few majors came a lieutenant and above a few lieutenants came general. Finally at the head of the military was the current Titus family patriarch and son of the defeated vampire King Rumi, Raven Titus the total active military personnel under the Titus clan banner were 200 million, and they were stationed across the 14 planets that the clan controlled spanning over four solar systems. Except being mainly concentrated in homelands, there were a small fraction of forces deployed in the disputed Eastern Front as part of the royal crown duty. The vampire monarchy of Regus Aurelius shared its eastern boundary with the barbarian kingdom and the savage king. It was a region of constant dispute as there were four mineral-rich planets in the region that were claimed by both parties. With heavy military presence by both the vampire monarchy and the barbarians in the region, a stalemate had been going on in the territory for over 400 years since the peace treaty. In the last great war between the barbarians and the vampires there were heavy casualties of gods on both sides, and since then it was decided that there would be no godly presence on the four planets and the party that was able to win complete control of the planets would take full control of the planets. Since then, the area became a highly militarized zone and the vampire monarch Regus Aurelius passed a mandate that forced all subsidiary clans to maintain presence in the zone and contribute towards security of the vampire state. As the stalemate in the region grew, so did the agitation of the clans to be wasting resources there and Regus Aurelius was forced to increase the rewards and merits related to fighting on the eastern front lines. In the end, it was declared that the clan having the highest contribution in freeing any particular planet would be given control over all its resources and administration. While this was a big concession on Regus Aurelius's part, it also meant that now the clans not only fought against the barbarians but also amongst each other to keep each other in check so that no one clan could claim an entire planet to themselves. This only caused the stalemate to worsen over time to the point that the vampires had not gained a single inch of land over the last twenty years. While this seemed like a hopeless battlefield, one man in Max's past life was able to break the stalemate and take control of one of the four disputed planets through a genius strategy. In the end he gained merit points with not only the clan he served, that a Caesar clan but he was named Lord by Regus Aurelius and given control of the planet he won. It was exactly this knowledge that Max now hoped to utilize to gain the planet for himself and gain an explosive reputation amongst the entire vampire kind. Dot to achieve this Max needed to quickly gain merits within the Titus clan military and be deployed on the Eastern Front. Hence, the same day as he was made garrison commander Max headed to his post to assess the situation and take full control of his troops. Max's current deployment saw him and the group posted on planet Nymus, a Titus clan agricultural planet that produced nearly 40% of all the food of the population. The planet was blessed with fertile soil and was covered with greenery all around. It had two distant suns in the sky and the temperature was pleasant and perfect for crop development. Upon arrival Max was greeted by the 13 existing captains and was given a tour of the lands and informed about the local affairs, as the rest of the group settled into their roles as captain. When the other captains realized that Max was a graduate from the Academy for Nourishment of Young Talents, he instantly gained a lot of respect as they understood that Max definitely had some noble identity. Overall, his transfer of power was peaceful and he and the group were able to settle into their new roles quite easily. Chapter 255 First Day, First Plan You Are Listening at NovelFull.Audio Reporting to Garrison Commander Sir, our garrison patrols a land area of three small towns Sir. The biggest problems we face are from wild animals infesting the fields and from bandits Sir. The locals are very cooperative and patient with us Sir. They have much respect for the army in general, one of Max's captains reported as Max looked at the map of the region he controlled and realized that there was a cave within his territory that was known to be a bandit hideout, yet nobody had done anything about it in the last two years. Max pointed at the bandit cave and asked, if we know the bandits hide here, why don't we attack them? Reporting to garrison commander sir, there were two failed attempts in doing so sir, the caves have multiple unconfirmed entry and exit points sir and various rigged narrow passages. 
Whenever we send troops inside, the bandits collapse these passages and crush our troops under the rock. To make things worse they escape from unknown exit routes and the raid always ends in failure, the captain reported as Max nodded and dismissed him. Max realized that there were only two major things worth accomplishing in the area that he was deployed in. One was to flush the bandits, and the other was to attack the rebel stronghold about 250 kilometers away from the edge of his jurisdiction. While Max was living on a peaceful planet that was mostly under complete Titus control, a small rebellion had risen not far from his lands where the rebel forces had captured one major city. For the last six months, the rebels had decided not to pay taxes and were acting increasingly brazenly. Although there was no official extermination order, all garrisons had been informed to stay vigilant of rebel activities. Max knew very well that if he wanted to gain merit points and fast, he needed to get those two accomplishments under his belt as fast as he could. The issue of the bandits seemed simple to Max, if one created a controlled fire around the caves that they lived in, the smoke and the ash from the fire would make breathing in confined spaces very hard and force flush out all the bandits. By setting up a counter-perimeter, Max could easily kill them all out as they popped up. On the other hand, the issue of the rebel stronghold was much more complicated. The rebels did not just control lands, but also had civilians as hostages under their jurisdiction. If Max tried to attack brazenly he would undoubtedly cause unnecessary civilian casualties that would reflect badly on his resume. The job needed more nuance and more planning, and hence Max deployed his trusted servant Severus to infiltrate the rebel-controlled city and gather information for Max, as he rounded the entire garrison and took them all out for a walk in the meantime. A while later in an open ground, Max's entire garrison of 160 troops and 16 captains waited for him in an open ground as they had all gathered here on his command. Max stood in front of the group and made eye contact with each and every soldier under his command before saying, Soldiers. How do you all like money? His question baffled his men, as while everyone understood what Max was asking nobody could react in time to scream back the answer. When the troops lined up for Max's speech, they expected him to say some boring motivational stuff but Max baffled them by asking them such an unique question. I guess nobody drank blood properly today. I asked you all, how do you all like money? Max asked again as he stared in his men's eyes in anticipation. We love money sir, one of the soldiers said as Max looked at him and said, step forward soldier, the soldier stepped out of formation and saluted Max as Max tossed him a bag of 10,000 gold coins and said, since you love money soldier, here is 10,000 gold coins for you, the soldier was baffled, this was like 3.4 months of pay. He was clearly overjoyed. Dot Max asked the group once again, how do you all like money now, eh lads? As the entire garrison replied, we love money garrison commander, Max felt satisfied and smiled under his mask, as he brought out 16 sheets of paper from his inventory and said, 16 identical task sheets, a team building exercise for you all today. I'll hand them over to your captains now and they will explain the detailed rules to you. The basic idea is to kill some threatening monsters in the area and construct a small clearing in the area I've pointed out in your sheets. There are points for the amount of monsters you kill and points for the speed at which you construct the clearing. You can see it as a team building exercise, with the winning unit receiving a cash price of 150,000 gold coins. So the only question now is, which unit will take the crown and take home the price of being the best unit in my garrison? Max said as he handed out the sheets of paper to all the captains. Excitement was visible in the air as Max's way of handling things had lit a fire under everybody's ass. Not only did all the units want to come first for pride, with the added benefit of a sizable money reward the soldiers were ready to give it everything they had got to win this task. What they did not realize is that under the guise of fun and games Max was making them clear the forest of dangerous pets and construct a fire demarcation line all around the bandit hideout. In Max's genius plan, the end of the games was going to signal the start of the bandit extermination. In his very first day at work, Max was going to solve the problem that his predecessor had failed to address, all while playing fun and games. Forward slash forward slash forward slash a slash n.
Bonus chapter for hitting the PS target, good job everyone. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 256 Fire You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. The event started out pretty fun, as vampires the troops were very attuned to killing large monsters in the region as they often used them to drink blood. Hence when they were faced with predators that would generally be dangerous to civilians at around tier 1 strength, the troops would chase them throughout the woods like they were some small bunny. Max had cleverly demarcated them into 16 equal zones that created a circle around the bandit hideout, and while the troops hunted and worked on creating the demarcation line that Max asked them to, Max quietly scouted the bandit hideout. The bandit scouts had noticed that the army was going about some exercises in the vicinity, but looking at the joy and the happiness of the soldiers as they chopped up wood and hunted animals the scouts believed it to be some routing sporting activity and did not think much of it. On the other hand, Max's predatory eyes scanned their hideout and got an estimation of their strength as he figured out that there were 7 tier 3 bandits and a total of 40 tier 1 and 2 bandits inside the cave. The strength of the bandits was a little lower than the strength of the army, and under the right circumstances this pitiful strength could be nullified easily so that casualties could be reduced to minimum. Max had deliberately kept the event duration to a low two hours as by the end of the event all the troops were pretty much at their exhaustion limit having gone out on full cylinders in the last two hours. The end result was definitely to Max's satisfaction as each unit had killed about 9.15 big monsters and everyone had completed their construction of the clearing as Max generously rewarded each garrison with 10,000 gold coins and the winning garrison under Anna the promised sum of 150k. Morale was high within the troops after the task was over, but just when they thought that the fun and games were over Max came up with another event. Bringing out a second circular, Max handed each captain another event circular but this time it was labeled as surprise event, the rules of the surprise event were simple, the captains were supposed to ask the crew to pour the blood of the defeated monsters into the clearing to create a small 3 inch wide stream of blood, and then take battle positions and hunt for escaping bandits. The captains were surprised by this weird order, but were quick to act on the garrison commander's instructions as their loyalty to Max had soared after the round of rewards. Soon a circle of blood was created all around the bandit cave spanning a wide distance of 2 kilometers radius as Max cracked his head and finally got to work. Jumping inside the clearing, Max began setting fire to the tree life inside as he spammed fireballs non-stop like nobody's business. By the time the bandit scouts realized Max's intentions it was already too late, as before they retreated back into the caves to inform their leader about the trick of the army Max incinerated the scouts using a fireblast attack. The increase in power after the Agni Astra upgrade was simply insane, the casual spells Max threw had strength akin to tier 3 attacks and Max could continuously spam them without expending any mana at all. As the troops observer their leader set ablaze the forest and walked through the flames unfazed, they finally began to realize the sheer power he held as a warrior as their respect for him deepened. Nicknames like Flaming Mask Demon, Kama, Flame God, and Incinerator started to float amongst the men as everyone observed Max's never-ending spree of spamming fire spells with mouths agape. Finally, when Max felt like the fire was now self-sustaining, he clapped his hands together and used his spell, Death Circle, to send the bandits trapped inside to the next level of anxiety. The big circle of blood exhausted way more mana than Max expected it to, as it depleted nearly a fourth of Max's mana bar to activate one skill. But in Max's eyes it was going to be worth it because he understood psychological warfare better than any 1.10.10.15 Max saw a constant stream of damage notifications and smiled he could imagine the faces of the poor bandits trapped inside the caves thinking how the fuck were they losing HP points without anyone even attacking them. Their perplexion over this matter would lead them to making poor judgment and decisions and play right into the hands of the military waiting outside. Soon, the smoke from the fire began flooding the cave's insides making it impossible for bandits to breathe as the first row of bandits began their escape attempt only to be faced with a unit ready for their fleeing attempt. Each unit saw not more than 3.4 individual bandits trying to flee and after a short but intense fight were able to kill the bandits without much hassle. 
While fights at most places were concluded easily, there were four units that were facing tier 3 opponents and struggling a little more than others. One of them was Sebastian's unit, which was facing two tier 3 bandits at once, however, Max was not worried about Sebastian as he knew that his friend was more than capable of taking two bandits down even with his eyes closed. Max instead headed towards the unit where the bandit leader had showed up alongside two other tier 3 subordinates making it the most difficult battle. Spot of the day. Summon Nether Beasts, Max summoned his beasts as he charged alongside them into battle as with his arrival the tides of the war that were against the unit captain changed fast. The unit captain had fought bravely to stave off his three attackers until now and although injured he was still in fighting shape. Take it easy now captain, I'll handle it from here, Max said as he assured the captain that he did not need backup in this fight. I can still fight with you garrison commander, the captain insisted, however, Max just chuckled and said, for these small fries, nah no need, the bandit leader was irritated at this comment and charged at Max while yelling, impudent kid, I'll show you just who I am, Max let him approach unrestricted as he held both his arms behind his back. The bandit leader swung his axe with full strength, thinking it was going to be a guaranteed hit, however, Max dodged it like it was nothing, before placing his arm on the bandit leader's chest and saying, boom, inferno. Forward slash forward slash forward slash a slash n. This chapter is sponsored by Patron Revolt 2010 via Patreon, please thank him in the comments for this one forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 257 Cleanup You are listening at NovelFull.audio To say that Max's garrison made swift work of the bandits would be an understatement. From start to finish the skirmish barely lasted 25 minutes before the enemy was thoroughly routed. Max's garrison only faced minor injuries and there were no casualties in the raid. It was a flawless execution all around and even the soldiers themselves could not believe that the problem that had been ailing them for two years was solved by the new garrison commander in one day while playing games. As they recollected the garrison commander's terrifying fire abilities, especially his final move, Inferno, that killed the bandit leader in one shot, they realized that their commander was proficient in both battle tactics and fighting. The captains who were a little more perceptive about the situation realized that the commander had single-handedly created a situation where the bandits had to come out and launch a scattered attack. Not because they wanted to, but because they were forced to. Max had not only controlled the environment and pacing of the battle, but he had also killed the scouts and the bandit leader before they could cause any damage to the plan. The planning and the execution were both perfect. As Max passed by the burnt battlefield, the captains began to tremble as a mixture of fear and respect urged them to shout to their units, Unit 7, Salute Garrison Commander, Unit 8, Salute Garrison Commander, Unit 1, Salute Garrison Commander, from start to end, every single garrison saluted Max as he passed by, not a single soldier slouching or saluting half-heartedly, realizing that they had found a great leader. Asaiva looked on towards Max with pride, he was developing into a man extremely well. From the clueless individual who was her roommate, to this fine warrior who demanded the respect of everyone he was around, Max had evolved. Asaiva had no doubt in her mind that if he continued to grow like this, then one day he would be the vampire king and command the respect of the entire universe. Good fight men, today we routed the bandits plaguing our territory. I spit on their corpses for looting and pillaging innocent farmers. It's not something I can tolerate while being garrison commander. Neither monsters nor bandits should threaten our local population, they should farm in peace even if it's 2 a.m. midnight. Today you showed me you are brave men, good men, strong men. Today you gain my respect. Good job. Max said as he unintentionally shifted his talking tone from that of his own to that of Rudra's. Max had seen Rudra give these speeches to his guild all the time, in front of crowds that were millions in numbers. He would always feel his blood rile up when he heard his brother address a crowd, and hence when it was his turn to address one he psychologically tried to be just like his brother. It worked brilliantly as well, the troops had a wide smile on their faces when Max complimented them, morale soaring even higher. Today we will feast. Tomorrow we will rest, but the day after we start preparing for what's next. You may wonder, 
but what is next? And that will be a brilliant question. What's next is the rebellion stronghold 250 kilometers away from our border. While not under our jurisdiction, the effects of the rebellion can be seen in the parts of the towns we control as well. The respect for law and order and local authorities is low because of the rebellion and it's about time someone put an end to it. So start preparing men. We already got the glory of routing the bandits soon, we get the glory of routing the rebels too, Max declared confidently as he saw the nervousness and excitement in the eyes of his garrison. Currently they were wondering if the garrison commander was serious or not, as they had never thought that their garrison would mount an attack on the rebel stronghold. It was all too sudden and too wondrous. Although the army was always swift in making decisions, there were still meetings done and permissions taken before engaging in combat. Their current garrison commander however seemed to not give two fucks about any of that, if he saw injustice, he was ready to act on it. Hushed talking began amongst the units and the captains as Max smiled under his mask looking at their doubts mixed with anticipation. Well you all are dismissed, I still have to do the boring stuff of writing reports and asking for permission and all, but don't let all that dampen your spirits today. Party hard soldiers, the three seasons in is booked for the army today. Go, drink, eat and party all you want, it's all on the house. I'll join you all after I'm done with today's paperwork, Max said as a loud cheer erupted from the garrison. If there was one thing men appreciated across races, it was alcohol and food. Give men both of those and they would be happy for months. While the garrison did not understand the tricks Max had played today, he had very carefully used the cards of strength, money and respect to gain total loyalty of his troops. He had not only flexed his strength, but also given monetary rewards and respect to his troops. Now everyone loved him, and nobody was likely to go against his orders. In one day, Max had conquered their hearts. It did cost Max a lot of money, but it was worth it because Max needed his troops' full trust and commitment to him if he wanted to rout the rebels and since he did not lack money after the auction, this was the best method to score points with the group. As the troops enjoyed at the inn, Max wrote a very flamboyant report of the bandit extermination and sent it to Major Ratty. He expected the letter to cause a small ripple in the military when the higher-ups read it. And a bigger one when they read the request to carry out rebel extermination that was attached beneath the report. Chapter 258 Scouting You Are Listening at NovelFull.audio Hey Donnie, are you reading this? Ratty asked baffled at what the fuck was going on, exterminated the bandit camp placking the area in full on the first day of his work, now wants permission to exterminate the rebel stronghold. I don't have the balls to attack the rebel stronghold but he thinks he can do it with a small garrison. Where exactly did we pick this kid off again? Ratty complained as he could not believe his eyes. I think you promoted him to garrison commander for having a strong handshake, good foresight sir. Donnie the assistant complimented Raddy being the bootlicker that he was, yeah, but now he's behaving psychotic. What should I do? Raddy asked as he panicked thinking that all the reports submitted to him will go on to lieutenant commander at the end of the month. Give him permission sir, that's what you should do. If he gets his garrison killed, pin all blame on him, if he pulls off an unlikely miracle then it was your operation from the get.go. You can be promoted by taking the credit, Donnie replied as Raddy's eyes brightened at the proposition. Giving Max approval to perform special military operations in the rebel area, Raddy decided to take the wait and watch approach. While he was sure that Max would fail, he could not wait to hog the credit should he succeed. Meanwhile Max, Max partied hard with his troops, although staying mostly at his own private table with his three friends, Max did visit the other captain's table once and fulfilled his social duties. It was a good atmosphere overall in the camp, but his mind was preoccupied with something else. Not fifteen minutes ago, he tested his newly gained skill the death plague, as he realized that if he wanted to perform silent warfare, he could make the life of the rebels a lot more difficult should he unleash the plaque behind their city walls. 
In 15.30 days' time he could get the infection rate as high as 40% and farm tremendous amounts of EXP while forcing an internal rebellion from the people to open up the city gates and forcing the rebels to seek external aid. However, this method would cost the lives of innocent civilians and Max had reservations about using innocent lives for his victory. While his ambitions were paramount for him, he did not want to become morally lawless if he could help it and hence he decided to wait until Severus came back with solid news and he got a letter from Major Ratty before deciding future course of actions. Meanwhile Severus the sweeper, Severus was sweeping the streets of the rebel city while collecting information about the surroundings constantly through his superior hearing. If there was one thing that the Saint Maximus clan was best at doing, it was collecting information through their bloodline ability. The sweeping made Severus invisible to common folks and rebel officials even though he was very much physically present and visible to the naked eye. Nobody seemed to mind his presence or watch their conversation while he was sweeping nearby. It was like people actively tried not to make an awkward eye contact with Severus and hence played beautifully into his plan as Severus stayed out of ear. Shot distance of normal vampires and made people think he could not hear Jack's hit, while he heard everything everyone said. The rebel city was primarily made up of two concentric walls. The outer wall was lower and the inner wall was higher, and the gates connecting these two walls were not aligned but rather places in a zig-dot-zag manner which made it nearly impossible for invading forces to enter the city through the walls, as they would face unbelievable losses at the hands of the higher position troops hurling arrows and javelins at them. The security of the city was so good that the Titus clan grew complacent and stationed minimal troops in the place, thinking it was impregnable, but an internal rebellion saw the city forces being defeated overnight and the territory becoming a rebel zone. The rebels made some popular economic reforms, making the area tax-free in dealing with space pirates and the like to trade for food and essentials in dot exchange for services. This made the city grow economically and reduced the burden of not being able to integrate with the rest of the planet. While it was a good arrangement, it was not perfect and many commoners did not support the rebels at heart. According to Severus's survey, should Max try and dethrone the rebel forces there would be minor riots but nothing major and civil order could be restored quickly should the rebels fall. This only left the question of how to defeat the rebels, as Severus tried to assess their strengths and the overall weakness of the territory. While a solo tier 4 warrior like Severus could easily scale the walls undetected and infiltrate the city, it would be impossible for tier 1 and 2 troops to do the same and hence Max could not sneak the garrison inside like he entered the city. Severus hence needed to figure out an entry route and get a confirmation on the enemy strength before he could go back and report his findings to Max, and maybe clean a bit of trash in the process as the city was extremely dirty as well. Fucking rebels, don't even have proper sanitation workers. This place stinks worse than Max and Asiva's apartment and those kids trained for 16 hours a day and slept without showering, all slimy and bloody. I cleaned that place three times a week, but this city will take my entire clan a week to clean completely. It is personal now, I must make the rebels pay for this hygiene mismanagement, this crime cannot go unpunished, Severus mumbled as he got distracted from his scouting work and seriously began focusing on his sweeping work. Forward slash forward slash forward slash a slash n. Bonus chapter for hitting the grow a tree target on Discord. Good job guys forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 259 The Gathering You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Max's POV, two days later, the city stinks, it stinks, can you believe it that there was a restaurant in the city that had food waste lying around for five days. It had fleas flying all around it. Nobody seemed to care, Severus complained to Max. Max was trying to be as patient as he could with Severus's ranting, however his patience was running out. So Severus aside from the city's sanitation problems, what have you got for me? Max asked as he hoped that Severus did more than just waste his time cleaning the streets, about 40% of the population support the rebels, a siege or a drawn-out battle will definitely get citizens involved. We need to have a fast and clean victory, however, the city walls are impregnable and the rebel forces outnumber us vastly. There are about 40,000 tier 1 and 2 soldiers guarding the city and about 200 tier 3 captains. 
In the end we also have about five tier four officials at the top which run the city. Severus reported as Max fell into deep contemplation this was truly a difficult challenge, there was no scenario where Max with his garrison of barely 160 troops could take down 40,000 in even an unfair battle, the odds were just too astronomical. This meant that Max had to get creative and think about something else to capture the city. The rebel council is run by the army and not by diplomats, all the tier 3 captains have a vote in things and all decisions are passed democratically. My understanding of the situation suggests that they are all meeting in the city hall three days from now to discuss trade with the wanted space pirate Goomba. They are going to assess the security risks and decide whether or not to provide him shelter. During the meeting the top brass will all be concentrated at one location in a small room. If we can take out the top management in one fell swoop then we can get the other 40,000 rebel soldiers to surrender. That without tier 3 and 4 fighters amongst their ranks, it will become impossible for them to hold on to the city on their own it's a good chance, but we don't even have forces capable of taking so many warriors out with the 16 captains, you and me it will still be 17 tier 3 warriors and 1 tier 4 warrior against 200 tier 3 warriors and 4 tier 4 warriors again the odds are stacked against us. Severus reported Max felt like he had a severe headache, taking down the city was. Proving to be challenging, not because the rebels themselves were something special, but because Max with his meager forces did not have the necessary strength to pull it off. If this were the tutorial game Omega, where death was nothing but a level penalty and a respawn in the Church of Life, Max would be much bolder in devising a strategy and attacking the town hall but this Sigma. In Sigma death was real inside battle, zones and even if he lost the life of a single captain serving him, that captain would lay dead forever. Hence, Max could not make rash strategies or make rash decisions. He had to have a stable mindset and only go in for the kill if the odds of victory and survival were in his favor. All right Severus, you did a good job. Give me some time to think, I'll call you guys if I have a plan of attack, all right, tell me if you need some specific information, Severus said as he took leave from Max's office. Meanwhile Marcus, Marcus was released from jail and as per his father's arrangement was taken to the eastern front lines on planet Maralego, where he was made captain of squad 37 he was introduced as Captain Marcus, his last name was not mentioned and was given no special privileges. He had to sleep where the other captain slept, in a single bed with barely clean bedsheets, and had to live the tough military life of reporting to work at 6 a.m. and train and patrol with his men. It was in stark contrast to his lifestyle just a week ago where he woke up late, had a lavish breakfast, picked up some woman for the day and accompanied her throughout the night before waking up late once more. To say that the sudden change was psychologically challenging was an understatement. However, it was made clear to him that if he did not comply and tried to reveal his identity he would not get his stipend for the month and then he would not only be powerless but also broke. Marcus had to show respect to his superiors, bow his head and salute, all the while knowing full well that should it be a week ago then these very men would swarm around him with compliments and salutes. However it made him realize that his father's words were true. Without the Aurelius name, without his father's respect, he was nothing. Even without the Aurelius name, if Regus walked into any room all the men in the room would bow their heads down to him in respect, not because they liked him but because they respected him. If Marcus wanted to earn respect he needed to get power. Not just power as a warrior, but power as a leader and power as an individual. Marcus hated training, he hated having to work for getting stronger, but he hated being disrespected even more. Now that he was banned from using his family name and could not throw his father's weight around to demand respect from others, his only other option was to train hard and earn his respect from others. Hence with no other motivation but to get stronger and squash everyone who disrespected him, Marcus began settling into the military lifestyle and training to level up and become stronger, because he would rather die than be trampled on by others. Chapter 260 The Plan You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. No. 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 Oh. Sebastian yelled at Max after listening to his crazy idea. Why not? You are great at it. Come on. 
Max complained back as Sebastian exasperatedly looked at Anna for some moral support, only for Anna to shrug her shoulders and say, yeah why not, dot, come on guys, this is ridiculous, you can't expect one handsome dwarf to do so much. If I get caught I die. Sebastian said as Asiva rolled her eyes and replied, if we get caught we all die, man up a bit will you. Oh, Max fanned the flames on Asiva's comment as Sebastian fumbled at finding words with his masculinity being questioned. Well, I'm a man all right, ask any woman I've ever been with. Sebastian said, trying to defend his honor. Yeah right, a 65-second man Anna commented as Max stared at her wide that I'd thinking that now it was going too far. Exactly, see Anna understands, Sebastian said, clearly not getting the sarcasm under Anna's comment but rather taking it as a compliment. Before anyone could burst Sebastian's bubble Max intervened as he said, look, I've met with the locals, nobody here understands what natural gas is although they have tons of reserves of it on this planet. They can't identify its smell and don't understand the risk it poses when concentrated in a large amount. If you go in with your pirate accent and give them a show while the concentration of the gas increases in the room, then after you teleport out suddenly, I can blow the whole town hall up and kill hundreds of tier 3 warriors and injure the rest. It's the only way we can take them all out quickly. Max's plan was simple, recently when he was wrecking his brains over how to get the job done, he came across a fissure in the earth which was leaking natural gas. The locals believed that the peculiar smell of natural gas was just sites where dead animals had been buried long ago and did not understand that it was a highly flammable gas. It was then that Max got the idea of harvesting this natural gas in abundance and sending Sebastian into the town hall meeting dressed as a pirate, pretending to be a representative of Goomba. Then as Sebastian kept them confused with his talking, he would also show them this mysterious gas and by the time the town hall people realized that there was something wrong, Sebastian would teleport outside and Max would light a small spark in the room to blow the town hall to smithereens killing large number of rebels gathered inside. A perfect sting operation after which killing the injured survivors would be easy. The only problem now was that Sebastian was not ready to play the role of a pirate and needed to be convinced. Why me? Why do you not play the role of the pirate or a saiva? Sebastian asked as he stared right into Max's eyes, because one, you are a great actor, the way you pulled off being a victim in front of Will Kingsman was legendary. Two, you have the teleportation ability, nobody else does, we cannot waltz back out at Will from the room but you can. Three, your handsomeness is distracting, it makes people less suspicious of what you say. Me with my red eyes, I look like a killer, Max replied as his logic mixed with flattery finally moved Sebastian's heart as the dwarf tried to hide the blush on his face for being called handsome. Oh stop, I know I look good, alright alright, I guess it can only be done by me, so I'll do it, Sebastian said as Max opened his arms wide to pull the man in for a hug. As Max and Sebastian went to the far corner of the room to discuss about the specifics of the plan the two girls went to the other corner of the room and tried to purify their ears after all the rubbish that they just heard. Your boyfriend inflates his ego too much, one of these days his bubble will pop and it will hurt much worse than it should have, because he would have inflated it too big, Anna said as she complained to Asiva about Max's role in Sebastian's delusions. I know but do you have the heart to tell Sebastian he is delusional? Asiva asked Anna as Anna sheepishly looked towards the ground and circled her toes. Well, um, no, Anna confessed as Asiva smiled and said, me neither, also it's kinda cute, the two boys are kind of cute, I know, I wish I could have a friendship as strong as theirs, Anna said as Asiva pulled her in for a hug and said, you have me, it was at this moment that Severus dropped in from nowhere and said, I can tell him if you guys want me to, quad it, Anna screamed from being jumped out of nowhere, god damn it, Severus I'll kill you, Asiva raged at being startled. The two women chased after Severus, with the intention of giving him a good smacking, however, Severus casually ran away from them chuckling all the way. It was another one of the warm days of the group when they worked a bit and goofed around a bit more, as their friendship and bonds deepened. 
Their leader Max had came up with an absolutely insane plan to topple the rebel government and it was going to take perfect coordination, unbelievable acting skills and a lot of luck to pull the damn thing off. But the belief in the group that they would succeed was strong. They had full faith of coming out of the fight the victors. Forward slash forward slash forward slash a slash n. Bonus chapter for hitting the GT target, good job everyone. Guys, I have an ambitious announcement to make. I see the GT rankings and notice that we are only 190 tickets short of the 10th spot and 205 tickets short of the 9th spot. If we try, we can really get to the top 10 GT rankings this month, and I want to try to aim for it. If we end the month in the top 10, I'll release 10 chapters on March 1st as a reward, but that aside, for the entire month of February I'll change the bonus gift structure. Magic Castle 1 Bonus Chapter Spacecraft 2 Bonus Chapter Gashapon 3 Bonus Chapter Gifting me with bigger gifts will now get more chapters. Help me reach the goal guys, I know you all can do it forward slash forward slash forward slash.